Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming along today to the Sustainable Transport webinar uh, presented by Community Energy Scotland and Carbon Neutral Islands. I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Stuart Masson from the Huntley Travel Hub and also Ewin McNeil from Voluntary Action Barra and Vattersea. The focus today will be on car clubs and community minibuses, and there will be two separate Q&A sessions to give everybody an opportunity to discuss both and ask any questions that you have. So I'll quickly run through the order of events and then I'll hand over. Um, we firstly will be having a presentation from Stuart uh, focusing on the car club delivery at the Huntley Travel Hub and its development um development of the car club that is uh followed by a q a session uh stuart will also be looking at other aspects of tra tra huntley travel hub um but there will be a focus on the car club that will be followed uh the q a following that will be followed by a presentation on the minibuses now stuart will begin that um talking about the information talking about the service they provide in huntley with their minibus and he will then hand over to ewan who will give you a presentation on the activities um at um barra and battersea uh, minibus community minibus service there the delivery of that and its development it's been going for quite a long time there's a lot of experience there there'll be a q a after that and that's we will wrap up um following that q a you'll see this meeting has been given an hour and a half we may or may not need that length of time but given the two areas of focus i thought it might be sensible um just to allow us that little bit of extra time over the the usual hour just in case we need it if you want to leave obviously before then um please please do so and we may not go that long anyway all right so i'm going to hand over to stuart then stuart masson from the huntley travel hub Thanks. Thanks, Kath. Um, thanks for inviting me on um, for, for doing this presentation. It's uh, much appreciated and to be given the opportunity to share what we're doing. Um, so, yes, so as Kath said, I'm, I'm Stuart Masson uh, from the Huntley Travel Hub, which is part of the Huntley Development Trust. Um, I joined in 2018, working specifically with the Travel Hub. Um, Huntley Development Trust as a whole is a much bigger animal, focusing on, on various elements uh, we'll go into today. Um, but this slide here shows a timeline of what's, what we've been doing since uh, we were founded in 2009 to date, um, with various projects, including uh, energy, uh, travel, um, town centre regeneration, um, among others. So you can these slides will all be available, um, and will be available to to speak to anyone about travel or any other uh, elements of the trust. Um, so the key date here for this purpose was two thousand and fourteen, which is when uh, the Huntley Travel Hub was created, um, where we had um, two community vehicles and six electric bikes that was how it all it all started um our fleet now um we've we're up to 22 electric bikes we've got three shared community cars two of them are hybrids and one full electric and we've recently acquired the the huntley community minibus um to the fleet as well um the car club, so as the focus of this is, is on car clubs, I'll, I'll focus the, the majority of the, the information on that. So we'll look at independent car clubs versus franchise, pros and cons. Um, I'll say a bit about the co-wheels model, um, tactics and strategy that we've used to develop the car club and create core users. Uh, through various marketing techniques, 
um, the impact of that, and then um, where we fund the the car club from. So franchise versus independent. So there's two routes you can go down once you've identified that your community is in support of um, or, or if you've done some sort of research to, to spot that this would work. We had a community engagement exercise called Room to Thrive, which highlighted getting about as an area which the community wanted to see developed. So that's why we just, we, we've decided to take the, the travel hub to the next level and increase the fleet. Um, so the franchise benefits for that are that all the back end tasks are taken care of. And by back end tasks, we mean booking, billing, customer support, which you get 24 seven, there's a customer support number. So as a, an organization, you're very much hands off, apart from the contact with the customers if anybody needed any immediate help at the at, at the at your end then of course we're there to help them out but generally speaking Cowheels uh, is a franchise and it can run completely it could run independently as they do they've got cars all over the the UK and not all of them are attached to an organization like ours um the vehicles are leased so every three years the vehicles get changed um you get a reminder they use a a system called Fleetio, and you get reminders, tells you which vehicles are coming in, which vehicles are going out, which ones are getting serviced and whatnot. It's very automated. Um, it's also recognised by government funders, so they're happy to, the Transport Scotland funding, um, some of them are happy to support car clubs, and they're more comfortable to do that if it's through a franchise. Um, the downside is it's quite expensive, uh, depends on the size of your settlement or area, but you're looking at around about £7,000 per vehicle to break even in hires. Uh, so the independent model, on the other hand, you'd have the freedom to choose your vehicles and you could set your own tariffs. Um, they're cheaper to run financially. Uh, I've put that in there in brackets because, because the, the admin would be intensive with the booking and billing and customer care the time element would be significantly higher uh, running a an independent car club as opposed to a franchise um you'd have the the responsibility for all the um the vehicle maintenance ongoing general asset depreciation how to handle that um and independent marketing so while we do marketing through the franchise, you can also take advantage of Cowheels uh, or other franchise car clubs for the nationwide marketing that they offer as well. So we went with the Cowheels route. Um, so as an, so this is for a customer. There's a one-off joining fee of twenty-five pounds, which gets you a key for the for the club. Um, that that is covering all your insurance tax. Any of the bills you would have associated with driving um, privately uh, are covered in that £25 joining fee. Then when you need the vehicle, it's pay as you go. So you can book the car, anything from half an hour up to a week. It wouldn't be cost effective to go for the longer term bookings. The idea behind this is that it's short bookings. People use the car as and when they need it. Um, the mileage ranges from five, uh, sorry, the pay as you go, the hourly rate ranges from 575 to 725, depending on the size of vehicle. Um, and then there's a, a mileage on top of that, depending on the journey length. Um, for full electric vehicles, it's five pence per mile. And for the hybrids, it's 20 pence per mile. Um, and it's very easy to book. You can do it online, you can phone them up, or you can use the app. Um, and the, the scheme is nationwide, so you can go anywhere in the UK and book a Cowheels car, use the same key, and you've got transport, community transport. Um, so to develop the car club, so that, that's a, we, ident we, we realised that we were never going to make that £7,000 per vehicle back. Uh, it was something that we were going to have to try and develop uh, ourselves and also plug the gap 
in the, the income with external funding. But it was sought after by the community and it was something that we felt as, a, as an organization we wanted to, to pursue. Um, now this funder here, Smarter Choices, Smarter Places, they've been integral for us developing the car club because they've allowed staff time to be claimed for. Uh, a lot of the funding out there is only for capital costs, but these guys allow you to, to have staff members, which has allowed us to have, I've been full-time with Huntley Development Trust. We've allowed, been able to do extra marketing and develop a core group of users, uh, think strategically about the positioning of our vehicles and adding more to the fleet. So funding is, is key to making it work. You could just put the cars in there and leave them to run um, organically, if you like, and they would, as a rural, uh, as a rural community, that's much more difficult. I mean, the cars in Glasgow, for example, are used. The utilisation is around about fifty percent, whereas in Huntley, it's around about ten percent. So it's much harder. It needs a lot more effort to get it out there. Um, just being a rural, a rural um, settlement. Once you've got your core users. It's really important to use them. So this nice uh, this lady here wrote off her car. Um, they were okay, which was great. Um, she joined Co Wheels to plug the gap while she was waiting for the insurance claim and realised that in fact she didn't need a car in the end. So it's a nice story. We help her out. Um, you know, she's got a son there. There's, we've got bike racks which we have attached to the car. They like their cycling. So ensure that they can take their bikes away with them. Um, you've got, it's about understanding the exact requirements of the users, especially when there's so little of them in these rural places. Um, and if you offer additional services, it's a, a key way to, to, keep, um, to keep your core users. We have to get out there. There's, there's local farmers markets. Um, eco awareness days, community gatherings, school fairs, networking events. We try to be as visible as possible to the community at such events in order to grow the, the car club numbers, awareness, um, hire of the electric bikes. Now with the minibus, it's a, it's a small place. Not everyone's got social media, although that is the main way to get in touch with people. Um, Huntley's got, I think it's 25% of the population's over 65. So we've got an older uh, demographic which needs to be catered for. Um, so getting out there as much as possible um, is, is key to raising awareness for the, for the car club. Um, like I said, social media generally is the best way to get in touch with people, having said that. Um, so having a, a solid Facebook page or any other uh, channels are are, are good for, for building your customer base. We've run competitions in the past, uh, offers. Um, we use marketing uh, funding, for example, from Smarter Choices to boost the posts to get them into more people's line of vision. Um, this was one that we ran. It was a quiet period for the e-bikes. So we ran one here, hire the bike for £20 a week or £40 for a month, anything to get the shared services out there. Um, it's better than assets sitting idle. Um, so all of that impact, the impact it has is that our car club usage is, is growing significantly. Um, and even though we're not quite at that £7,000 per vehicle income yet, we're heading in the right direction and we're not far off. And it's, it demonstrates that we should continue to pursue um, the car club through a franchise as a, a sort of strategy for the for the trust, the travel hub specifically, um, you could look at it and say you're not quite covering all your costs, but it's clearly demonstrating that we will get there. It's just a sake of year on year. Obviously, there was a dip there for COVID, uh, where the car was basically hardly out at all. But since since that's finished, it's um, the usage has risen significantly. Um, so that uh, it ties in with our electric bike hire. So we look at it as a package. We like people to use all of our services. Um, that's the ideal scenario. And um, so we've got on top of the three cars, 
where we've got bike racks available as well. So people can um, use both modes of transport. Uh, we've got 22 electric bikes, um, half and half between city bikes, which is step through Dutch style bikes and mountain bikes, which are better for some of the rural terrain up here. Um, we've focused on long-term hires and changing travel behavior. And that's for two reasons. One is that we genuinely do want people to stop driving um, private vehicles and look at an electric bike as an alternative. That's very hard to do if somebody hires it for a day or two. We encourage people to take it for a month or multiple weeks in order to get used to storing the bike, charging it, um, what it would be like to actually own one. Uh, it's a big investment for certain people, so getting a, a real taster for it um, is going to help people make their decisions and hopefully change their travel behaviour. Um, so we've increased from six to 22 bikes in the three years um, due to demand, fully due to demand. And of the um, around 300 people, the, the last 300 people who've purchased a bike, uh, who have hired a bike from us have gone on to purchase one um, due to the fact that they've had enough of a taster to enjoy it and feel like that is a mode of transport that they can use moving forward. So that's a stat that we're particularly proud of is that conversion rate of people uh, hiring to people purchasing. And like I said, if people get the mem a bike plus the car club membership and access to the community minibus, it does question the need for not so much a private vehicle, but certainly the families that maybe have two private vehicles or three. That's the people that we're um, that we try to encourage to to change their their behaviours. And all that's led to us bursting at the seams. So we have um, we came to the point that we had no space for all these bikes. Uh, we were beg, borrow and steal any garages and storage spaces that people had to offer. But through a fund that we're working on at the minute, we're currently refurbishing a 65 square meter space right in the center of Huntley, um, which will be open in September 23. And it will be a, a set space for the Huntley Travel Hub uh, of operations for the e-bike. It'll be a chance for people to come in and talk about the car club access maps of the local area, comment on community consultations. We'll do some main bike maintenance courses in the maintenance area at the back. And so that's ongoing just now. We're really excited about that we've come to the point that we've been able to justify specific premises for the Huntley Travel Hub. So if anyone's in Huntley from September 23, do pop in. Um, and it attracts bigger events. So if you, when you start to, um, sort of become known for bike hire and, and car hire. We got contacted by the organizer of Ride the North, um, who knew that we took sort of cycling and active travel seriously in Huntley and the, they're hosting the Ride the North event in Huntley this year on 26th of August, uh, where we're expecting 100, uh, sorry, 1,500 plus uh, entrants. So that's a really exciting event to come to Huntley. I feel that that's sort of due to our, uh, the last sort of well since 2014 really the the effort that we've made to increase cycling awareness and shared transport awareness in the area and we've also been allowed to look at um we've been looking through sustrans at actually changing the infrastructure of Huntley town itself to make it more suitable for pedestrians and cyclists and also obviously taking cars off the road but still needing cars best way to do that is through a car club um, so we've got two, we've had two studies done um, about what we could achieve in the town centre of Huntley. And you can see some of these images on the left here. This is um, Waltham's, Waltham Forest in a borough of London where the Mini Holland project uh, started and it has significantly reduced the, the traffic in the town centre. So we've been allowed or given the opportunity to look at projects like this off the back of our core purpose, which is the cars, the bikes and the bus. So the funding streams, obviously money is important, 
um, Paths for All is our core, core one. That's the one I showed you before through the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places Fund. That's predominantly revenue costs, which is um, staff, uh, marketing campaigns, that type of thing. The Energy Saving Trust have a plugged in households fund, which is allowed us to get the electric vehicle you see in the picture there. So that, that paid for the lease of that vehicle for the first year, plus marketing. Um, the Energy Saving Trust also do the e-bike grant fund, which is capital costs only, so just the purchase of the bikes. Um, same with Cycling Scotland. Then there's Vattenfall, which we use, Unlock Our Future Fund. Um, Sustrans, that's the one that enabled the, the Mini Holland to, to, to kickstart that. Um, that's through the Places for Everyone Fund. And then we, our, our local council, Aberdeenshire Council, have been very supportive in um, a lot of the active travel stuff we're doing, uh, particularly match funding some of the building refurb and electric bike um purchasing and whatnot so it's good to build a, a a good relationship with them particularly the sustainable transport team we found to be extremely helpful so that's it for me thanks very much for listening and i will hand you back to kath you're on mute kath I know, rookie mistake. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, that was it. really interesting. I'm sure everybody would agree with that. Um, I mean, congratulations on, you know, on such a successful um, development, well, developments, I should say, and activities. Uh, there's obviously a lot of hard work gone into that, and it's paying dividends. So, Yes, I'm sure people have got some questions and I think we might have some interesting discussion. So um, would anybody like to start by asking Stuart a question or raising a point based on what he's just presented? Yeah, I've got my hand up there. Sorry, Kat, I don't know if you noticed it. That's um, all right. I was just wanting to ask Stuart, you mentioned the hour, hourly rate uh, higher. What, what does that come in at? So it varies on this depending on the vehicle. So they've got there's we've got like for example a small Toyota Yaris, and then we've got a bigger estate Corolla estate. So that the smaller ones are five seventy five an hour, and it ranges up to seven twenty five an hour depending. There's four categories within the co-wheels um, pricing structure, and they and they range between those two prices, and then your mileage on top of that. And in, in terms of your franchise and the break even of seven thousand, um, anything you make is anything you make over that your own your own income then. Yeah. But anything that falls below it, you have to make up the differences. So. Yeah. So, so how how it works is every, once a year we get an annual bill from Co Wheels to cover the lease of the vehicles, um, and then a we need them. Cleaning's a key thing. I should have probably mentioned that in the in the sort of, sort of oper talking about the operation of the club. But we need them cleaned every. It depends on the season, but generally every fortnight we would get them valid. So there's an a, there's a cost attached to that. The way we do it is we pay um, a local a local company a um, thousand pounds, which gets us like twenty five valley credits, and then we just chip away at that and they'll let us know when we're running low basically and then there's other things you know like tires you have to if you if they wear out you have to sort that out yourself um general maintenance you have to have a wee budget for that so that's where this seven thousand it's in, all of that's included in there but the, the annual bill comes in that gets paid in a one hour and then we just budget you know say 300 pound a month per vehicles it varies and it's hard to, to actually budget for it when things come in out of the blue. Yeah. That's, that's it. And then month, and then every month, so whatever hires have come in, in the month, Co Wheels give us a report. Um, there will be the total minus uh, fuel. So there's a fuel card in the vehicle that the members use. They go along and, and they fill it up. So fuel comes off, insurance, there's, the insurance is done differently than when we started. Half of it's taken off as a one -er at the start of the year, and half is dependent on usage, which suits us. 
because we're generally a lower usage car club compared to the, the bigger cities. Um, so once all that comes off, then there's an, an amount left and that comes to your bank, basically. So we always get something back. We always get something back, but we've always paid out. We never quite managed to pay, to claim back everything that we paid out for the, the annual fee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Thanks. Deborah. Hello, um, Stuart, can you just, just give me a little bit of demographics on Huntley? Because I don't know it very well. What is your population size, first of all? Uh, so Huntley Town has around 5,000 people. Um, and if you include the sort of villages round about, it's around 11,600. Great. And um, what sort of size membership has your car club got? That's a good question because we've got around 85 members last time, last time I checked. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a big difference between members and active members. So when the car club started, there was, you know, there was sort of, it was before my time, but I think there was a, a sort of a, a promotion that, that ran and it was a farmer's market or something similar and it was free memberships, free memberships. So it's great signing people up, but if they're not going to use it, then it almost gives you a false. So I would say that we've got like 12 core users and they use it as their main form of transport. And then we'd have the next sort of circle outside that would be your say monthly users and they would use it when they needed a second vehicle or something like that and then outside of that the rest of the membership would be sporadic it would be their cars broken down and they need it once a year or two years so really and that's why I was focused on that core user because especially in a small town once you've got a core user and they go you would notice your income drops straight away just from one person stopping using it so it's really kind of you know important to grow that group whereas the big cities you know they'd have hundreds of members that come and go and there's not that sort of user element and can i just want to ask one last question how many of your e-bikes did you buy using um grants was was that all of them or have you actually paid for any of them through your own resources uh we've well this, the e-bike grant fund is our main fund for the e-bikes so we've we've had 15 of them through that fund and that's 50 percent funded um and then nest trans which i actually didn't have well that's we get funded by aberdeenshire council but nest trans offer some and then hdt have to put in the balance but yeah. generally generally speaking we've probably put in like 10 percent of the cost of the e-bikes ourselves and the rest have been through funders great that's great thanks very much Thanks, Deborah. Um, now, I'm not sure who is first between Cassandra and you and uh, Scott for asking a question. So Cassandra's put something in the chat. Um, I will, I'll, I'll, if you and if you don't mind, I'll ask Stuart the, the question on Cassandra's behalf and then you can speak next. Is that okay? Great. Um, Cassandra's um, asking about some more information on the Getting About project and research for that project. And she's particularly interested in how you approached the community and got everybody engaged or got them engaged. And how did you ensure that you knew what the community needs were without excluding anybody? So that's a big, that's going to, that's a big, uh, that's a big question that we could go specifically about this for a long time. And um, what I would suggest is I will share the document. It's a huge document, but it shows you how many people responded and there's various diagrams uh, to show you what the, what the people wanted. I think it's on our website, but if not, then I will make sure that it gets circulated. Um, I mean, in terms of how do you make sure without excluding everyone, we just have to put it far and wide. We've got our own membership, so 400 odd members through the Huntley Development Trust. It goes in the paper, it went around social media, it was in windows in the town, it went around the school, local businesses. We just had to scatter gun it. I mean, you can take a horse to water, you know, but it, it's up to people. There comes a point where people have to come in and say what they feel 
and what they want. So we, we, we felt like we gave everybody the opportunity to at least see that there was a consultation going on. So they came in and they had various things to, to there was sort of, we ran it through a company called Ice Cream Architecture um, and they put on some engaging uh, sort of community exercises, if you like. There was kind of tracing paper overlays of the town and people were drawing on what they wanted to see where. Um, so town centre regeneration got the, that's that was number one by a long way. And that's where we've purchased a bigger building in Huntley and we're currently doing a 3.4 million pound refurbishment right in the center of the of the town square um, and that's going to be community space there was comments that people there wasn't enough for kids to do there wasn't enough for teenagers to do nowhere for families to go so the plans for this space are community cafe cinema retail space heritage so that we've we're taking that as our first sort of frontline project if you like and then looked at other things that people want to see getting about for example and that's where we sort of dovetail but that the the town center generation is the flagship uh project but then, like i said that's a huge it's a huge um, consultation and it went on for for months um but i can share that with everyone it's a public document the the results from that it also outlines the process and how we approach people that's great. Thank you, Stuart. I hope I hope that's answered that those questions that you had, Cassandra. Um, Stuart, if you send me that the copy of that consultation, unless anybody approaches you separately, everybody's got my email, and then obviously I can send that through to anybody who contacts me for it. That would be great. Thank you. So, Ewan, Ewan Scott, I've got a bit of a, a naive question. What I'm interested in is that. Um, we already have a, um, a firm that does um, car hire on Barra. And I know from um, locally, Ellen will be able to feed into it, that there is an incipient um, car club developing on the island. But I'd just be interested to hear from Stuart what he perceives the differences are between general car hire vis-a-vis -vis, um, a car club. I mean, as far as I can see, it looks like ease of access through membership and putting out the paperwork. Is there anything you would add? I'd just be interested, you're, you're in the business, and just to know how you perceive them to be different. Yeah, so you, are you talking about like a, just a, a, a normal car hire company like Enterprise or something like that? Well, we've got a local to... guy that runs a fleet of about six cars, okay. and we could hire a car potentially for... I'm 30, 40 pounds a day. Um, and I'm just, if you're going to pitch it to someone, what the advantages of a car club are versus hiring from a, a small local firm. I'm, there are, I'm, as far as I can ascertain, certain advantages. If you're a member, you've done the paperwork so that the, the pickup and the hire should be cleaner and quicker. But I'm just interested what you perceive the dis differences might be. Yeah. I, I, I suppose that, well, there's the flexibility. So because the cars are fitted with the telematic, uh, the ones that we use are fitted with a telematic system. So you get your key and there's a, a digital box in the, on the windscreen. That's your access to the vehicle. So that encourages, uh, from what I gather you're saying is, is a, a day would be a kind of minimum hire through this guy. Um, it wouldn't is that yeah so it doesn't it doesn't lend itself to you know maybe some days we, we would have four people using one car and they would just be but and sometimes the same person would use it in the morning someone else would get in just you know and then it's it lends itself to short um short hires which is good for them because it's it's uh cheaper you know if someone needs to go to tesco's it's something to cost them say seven pounds as opposed to having to take the car for forty pounds for the whole day, um, yeah, I get that's the main one off the top of my. If I think of any more, because it is a good question. If I can think of any more, I will get back to you. And um, but it's just that convenience factor of of the short term hires. Um, I mean, forty pounds is is a reasonable rate if you need a car for a full day, but if you only need it for half an hour, it's not. 
Um, so that's kind of what we offer and encourage people as much as possible to keep their booking short. Not only does it open up for others, but it helps their pocket as well. I think that's a really good point, actually. Um, sorry, you when you're on mute. You can't I'm saying that, thank you very much. You're in the, I think there are differences. I mean, it's just good sometimes to articulate them. But that's grand. Thank you. Um, Stuart. Yeah, another Stuart. Obviously, it's a, it's a good name. <laughs> Pro properly spelt as well. Um, <laughs> so I'm speaking to you from uh, Rose, which is one of the smaller inhabited islands in Orkney and we probably have one of the more unique car clubs in that we only have about 250 residents um, and being on an island uh, they don't need to have an MOT on their normal cars so um, what they do is they run absolute bangers and then use our car club to get onto the mainland where they do need an MOT so it's a, a very strange car club but it doesn't make a lot of money we've got a Nissan Leaf and it's uh, 12 years old now, so the, the mileage range is, is less than it once was. But it's great for getting to the mainland, to Kirkwall and Tesco's and back. So it's a very strange car club. But I'm very keen to sort of look at expanding it to perhaps a second car, which has got more range, and then promoting it to tourists that come on to our island to explore the island. So the other way around, rather than the residents. And I just wondered what sort of uptake you have from tourists. I mean, the co-wheels thing is, uh, is UK nationwide, so anybody can be part of it anywhere, can't they? I wonder what your uptake on tourists was. And a little bit like you, and what did you get any conflict with existing businesses? I'm thinking of your minibus must cross somebody else's business. And we're we're frightened to death of traps uh, traipsing on um somebody that offers bike hire here or even somebody that's got a minibus that becomes a taxi sometimes. So we just did you have any conflict like that really? Uh, so the uh... The first one about the tourists, um, that is an area that we haven't quite been able to crack yet. Um, and it's purely, it's down, I would say it's down to mainly the fact that when people arrive, they, they, they would arrive to say Aberdeen and they would maybe hire the car from there. And if they were coming to Huntley after that, that would be, so that would be where they would hire the car from. If someone arrives in Huntley and realizes they need a car, what they don't appreciate is the co-wheel sign-up process takes about five days. By the time you sign up, then there's a DVLA check. Now, we can expedite it, but generally speaking, it is five days. Um, so by the time somebody actually gets a, a legitimate membership through, the need is gone. So co-wheels, that is probably a negative, is the time between deciding I want to drive one of them to actually being able to drive one of them. Um, doesn't lend itself well to tourists who only have a few days. Uh, but what we have found is that tourists to the area would, would generally drive um, from, assuming it's an international tourist, they would drive to from Aberdeen or Inverness. Um, very few tourists arrive to Huntley by train, which is something I think that's more of a national, um, a national issue. Uh, but if they did, then yeah, that would be the time that we would probably need to address that. Um, because we do have a car at the Huntley train station. And that was the idea, was that uh, that it could be used by tourists or people who are commuting to Huntley for work. Just on, just on that point, the only time I came to Huntley, I came by train. So <laughs> I was yeah. thinking whether you tie up with your local uh, rail partnership, development partnership or something like that to try and promote it that way. Just a thought. Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's it's a, it's a it's a good point, and it's one you, you only you can only do so much, you know. And it's growing your core user group, especially be it when you're challenged financially, and these core users are the ones that can actually keep the car club afloat. I think if we got to a position where we were breaking even, then it would be a time to sort of stri like stretch out and and try to put some of our time towards national partnerships. We have tried to engage with the 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 rail companies before to get e-bike lockers on the stations and it was a nightmare um a real nightmare um to the point that yeah they didn't want to support it they just don't want the liability of having to something else to, to look after or allow access to the, the platforms or whatever but anyway that's a set that's a separate kind of thing but yeah that was the that's where we are with tourists not many the caravan park in huntley we we do have 
Um, we have had a few hires through there and we've encouraged, so people arrive by saying motorhome and then they, they might want to have a small car to, to quiz about the local area in. Um, so we've, we've explained to the, the owners of the caravan park that if there is a need for that, if they can inform their, their, their customers in advance to get signed up so that the car would be ready for them when they arrive, um, that, is one, um, that is one that would be a quick win, if you like. Um, and then the second part to your question, what was that again? Um, conflict with existing businesses. Conflict, yes. Uh, no, we 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 work with with the tax with the taxi company. I mean, in fact, Huntley's just lost its only taxi firm. Um, it got put up for sale, and no one bought it. And now the guy's retired. So even getting a taxi in Huntley is is a nightmare at the minute. Um, I know that person because we live slightly outside, so. Um, it's been no fun trying to get trying to get a taxi anywhere. But um, with the community minibus, I mean, I'll come to that shortly. But uh, in the next part of this, but it's um, it's all local charity groups. Um, we've a very small operation, local charity groups and uh, clubs, and maybe the odd school trip, sports um, sports events. The minibus side of things is very much in the infancy at the moment we've just taken it on okay well that very conveniently thank you Stuart from Rousey takes us to the next section of our of our session today um where we're going to focus on the minibuses so I'm going to hand back over to Stuart who will um go over in a little bit more detail about what they're doing in Huntley and Stuart will then hand over to Ewan McNeil who will discuss what's happening in Barra. Okay, thank you, Stuart. And thank yeah. you for your questions, everybody. Okay. Oh, I can get onto my next slide, hold on a second. Try again. Okay, I'm just going to keep it in this format uh, for now. It's just one slide. So it's basically, um, yeah, so on top of what I spoke about before, um, and we've done it this way because Owen's focus is on minibuses. So I can't wait to hear from him because we're in, looking to develop ours um, to the sort of level that, that those guys are running at. But basically we had this, we've got this one bus, which was run by uh, a small group sort of elderly group that used it just for getting the odd, you know, shopping runs from local charities, sheltered housing, that kind of thing. And they kept it taking over for years and years just with the same sort of group. Um, but the chair was stepping down, no one was coming in to take it over. And while it's a small operation, a lot of people depend on it. Um, it's, you know, you can get a wheelchair on there. We've got three volunteer drivers um so we we couldn't see it sort of die if you like so we took it onto our fleet um around about october last year um and we're still strategizing about the best way to develop it um we're aware of licensing issues i mean we've got a section 19 license but i know there's others that you can get and there's various red tape and licensing issues if you want to run scheduled services and whatnot. So we're very much at the learning stage with it. We're continuing to take existing groups and customers, which were using the bus before, and we'll take ad hoc bookings if they come in. Uh, one thing that we have been doing is doing self hires. So people have been hiring the bus. We just encourage them to put the bus back with the same amount of fuel and we'll take a nominal fee off them. Um, but other than that, We've not we've not advertising it yet um, because we don't want to get into something that's illegal or that we can't manage because it's it's going to be too much work. So it's in its infancy, and I will be really interested to hear from Owen next 
who's going to be um, talking about their operation and many buses in more detail. Thanks very much, Stuart. Thanks. I'll try and share my screen with a practice earlier on. I'm not sure how well I did with it. Oh, well, that's a surprise. Can you see that, yeah? Looking good, Alan. Yeah. Good. Yeah, well, good. Thanks. Welcome to Barra. And, that's, uh, and thanks to the voice of you and there, you and Scott, who's one of my colleagues, works with the uh, um, the community development company, and they've been a, a, a great partner in developing community transport um, on Barra with ourselves. If I could just move this on to the next screen, if I can look at how you do that. Oh, I'm embarrassed. There we are. So I'll give you an idea. Um, the other Stuart uh, from Orkney actually uh, blew me away a wee bit because one of the things I was going to highlight, we were such a small community, but he's, his community is actually a lot smaller than ours. We've got a population of a thousand. So I think you said, Stuart, you were 250, so that uh, that, that beats us. Um, voluntary Action Baron Vatasi, we used to be uh, known as a Council of Voluntary Services, of which I understand uh, all those years ago there's over, there was over 600 and then Eventually, they, they all get stuck with the term the third sector, whatever that means. It's such a broad term and people usually glaze over when you uh, they ask uh, who you represent. Um, this diagram actually is quite a good representation of uh, what voluntary action does. And it's a bit like an octopus, I suppose, now that I'm looking at it. Um, we developed from a Council of Voluntary Services, Scottish Government, in their wisdom, came up with the term third sector interfaces, of which... There are one, there's a TSI for every local authority. Um, and basically, we're a membership organization, uh, VABV. Uh, all our members are, I suppose, we're an umbrella group. All our members um, join us, they pay an annual fee, uh, and we help them with uh, their community groups, basically, and we help them with their governance, help them find funding, uh, help them with the structures, uh, give them training support. Um, and VABV itself, uh, as a charity, uh, developed a lot of different services and helped set up, uh, pump primed a lot of services for Barra. And I suppose mostly it's because um, we always think we're, we're the furthest away from the centre of our local government. I think it's, you know, maybe keep me right, but I think we're about 90 odd miles away from Stornoway. And it's the ever de uh, decreasing uh, or expanding circle the, the services, the money that gets spent on roads and Stornoway, it costs probably about 10 times that to, to spend in the roads and Barra. And we can actually get to um, Edinburgh and uh, a seat of national government in Holyrood uh, in two hours by uh, plane to Glasgow and then bus, whereas overland uh, to Stornoway it takes us six to seven hours, uh, including two ferries. And I think the reason I'm saying that is because I'm trying to think about how Barra um, probably we were community empowered for, for a long, long time where um, we had less services. Uh, we relied on more volunteers, although um, they didn't really see themselves as volunteers. They just seen themselves as a group of people who would meet up and develop things for their own island and in a way the forerunner of community empowerment. Um, so. Just that going round clockwise there, uh, the Guvari is the kind of the, the local paper that we produce about maybe 500 a week. And that's that's based in, in my offices. Um, and that keeps the information flowing. It was more important before social media came along uh, right enough. So I, I suppose it's maybe a wee bit uh, less urgent. But nevertheless, we, we, we sell about um, probably about four to 500 a week on these. And that keeps the information flow on uh, a community basis. Uh, Ryland's got a population of about a thousand, I think I said. Um, we've developed interest in community radio. We do various bits of training. Um, we support local tourism uh, through where, where we can access funding for it through a, a ranger service, and that's to support environmental works aside uh, from doing uh, walks and hill walks. Uh, we discovered that um, a mixture of locals and visitors in the summer uh, we're not just interested in walking, um, but when we got to beaches, uh, it was amazing. We started lifting about a ton and a half a week of uh, plastics and uh, ropes and wires, uh, and that became an industry in itself. 
Um, and that, that really came from the people that were walking who were saying that they were really interested in the, the island, the heritage, but they wanted to do the cleanup as well. So it had a kind of environmental spin-off. Um, we support locally the Western Isles Lifestyle Lottery, where we help uh, the, the governance and the management of that uh, throughout the Western Isles. Um, Ewan uh, is very much involved, as am I, with the Carbon Neutral Islands. Uh, Barra was identified uh, as one of the six pilot areas uh, that aims to become carbon neutral by uh, 2040. Uh, and um, we've had a, a year of the islands benefited from a year of funding and we we're lucky to have a local who was first class honours uh, in that field who was successful in getting the development manager's post and uh, we're hoping that's going to expand over uh, the next couple of years uh, and, and again I think that's an excellent thing for the island and for young folk who are able to stay on the island and get a, 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 a good um, cost of living, um, a good income uh, from that post, normally um, most of our young folk have to go away to Edinburgh or wherever to, to work. Um, we've got an ADP partnership which delivers local support um, for any types of substance mis uh, misuse. Um, and the Isle of we develop tourism through that website. Um, and, and I've come to the end with the community transport, which is what we're, we're all here for today. And in a way, um, that's really what links up a lot of these services for us. We uh, we used to go about in an old rickety bus for years, uh, and then we eventually accessed some money, and it's just developed from there. And I would say, Barra being the smallest island, we've actually got um, the largest fleet of vehicles, although it's only five. Uh, I would say that we've uh, pretty much got the largest uh, vehicle through throughout the Western Isles. Um, we're actually uh, the envy uh, of um, a lot of my colleagues who can't access or are at the very early stages of trying to establish a community transport service. And again, that community transport service came about as because of the, uh, the poor public bus service that was available at the time. Um, going on to the next one, Bus Valley Community Transport Service Vehicles. So about 10 years ago, we started off, we purchased uh, two Mercedes diesel minibuses with lifts uh, and they have about 16 seats in them. We've also got two um, LDV electric buses. These are vans that were conversions. Um, they're purchased new, then they're, con uh, uh, they're converted by a company down south uh, to act as 10-seater uh, uh, minibuses. And we have one Nissan 7-seater, uh, which is an excellent wee vehicle. And if I could uh, get another five of these for the island, we would start our, uh, our own uh, car club because I've, I've got ideas for that. Um, we've got three, I'm saying we've got three drivers, we've got three to four drivers at different times. They work uh, different hours. We um, have three to five paid escorts. So every bus run we've done, because our clients are quite vulnerable, um, we always make sure we have escorts uh, uh, so that the driver is in charge of the vehicle and he can retain charge of that when he's parking up uh, while the escort helps the clients get on and off uh, the vehicle. Uh, and we've got a part-time uh, transport. He shares duties uh, with the transport, which uh, it takes a great deal of weight away from my own shoulders because of the amount of work um, that's involved um, and the reason I put volunteers down, our volunteers tend to be on our board. Um, one of the things that we realised quite quickly was that you can advertise for volunteers, and we are an organisation that supports volunteering in a wide range of fronts, but it doesn't really lend itself to community transport. Um, a lot of the uh, clients that go to uh, regular clubs, adult daycare, care services and what have you, um, they have specific needs, specific times. You have to have a timetable. And we found at the early stage that if you if you rely on volunteers, and it sounds bad that I'm saying well, if you rely on volunteers, but you need you need to know volunteers are going to turn up. And if you're a volunteer and you're doing it uh, for for really good uh, for, uh, reasons, there are times where you're not going to make it. Whereas if you pay someone. Uh, the, and it's a, it becomes a job, then people are more geared up to turning up for their job or letting you know early enough that they're not going to be there. Um, the last thing we want to do is let down a lot of these clients. So that does put a financial strain in us as well. 
Um, but we tend to keep the volunteers to uh, join our various boards and give us support that way. Um, I suppose I should have put that at the front where we are and where we connect. One of the, I think one of the reasons that we're quite successful is we're, in a number of ways, we're a very small island. Um, there's one circular road round and there's a couple of, there's a few offshoots fair enough over to Vattersea by Causeway and up to Elligary in the north. But by, by and large, that road that you're seeing around the centre there is 13 and a half miles. So we can get around uh, fairly quickly um, and it lends itself really well to our electric vehicles and the range that they have. I think the, the vehicles that we use at the moment, if they were to be in Lewis or in the Eusts, um, they would have they would face challenges having to charge them uh, fairly regularly because of the size of their islands. We're we're quite lucky. I think I think the length of our island is about maybe eight to ten miles, thirteen miles circular road. Um, who we connect to? So these these are various groups. Um, Garavaga Two is uh, in North Bay. It's a garden project, and they've got roughly about twenty five clients that we pick up at different times. From all parts of the islands, um, we, we cover, like I say, over to south in the Vatar, say north up to Elligary. And we take clients uh, to North Bay to this garden club. Uh, and the, the, the clients have got a, a range of needs. Uh, and we do that Monday to Friday. And we pick them up from their homes in most weathers, uh, unless like yesterday we were off the road because it was particularly windy. Um, but... Uh, we, we pick them up, we take them straight to their services for about 10 o'clock, and then we go back about 2 to 3 o'clock and pick them back up, take them safely back to their own homes. And that allows their own carers, those that have carers, a bit of respite, whether it's their family or whether they've got other folk. Uh, that, gives, um, uh, that gives them respite um, and the clients. It gives them a, a great deal of uh, interest in a bit of a large bit of independence as well, uh, carrying out all the, the work that the garden project does. A number of polytunnels growing and planting their own veg and what have you. So, so we connect these services, all these services that are listed, Core Vare again, that's more elderly uh, uh, clients uh, that are uh, taken in. We do the Barra Youth Cafes at the Friday, Saturday nights normally. We do youth clubs to the school, which is the, uh, the, uh, the younger uh, members, so that's kind of the primary cl uh, clubs, uh, and uh, we we support the the local youth clubs by providing them with the transport. We've got pensioners clubs and shoppers clubs, um, and uh, we uh, through the small car uh, car hire uh, sorry car vehicle, we've got the electric Nissan vehicle. Uh, our preschool nursery use them uh, use that quite often. Uh, for taking the weed tots out and about, and it's it's really good for that. Um, and we also do used trips with our buses, uh, mostly at the weekend because our buses are really busy Monday to Friday. But the weekend and most evenings, evenings they're they're pretty well laid up, and we're quite happy if um, someone wants to to borrow the bus. A, a group would take people over, um, and they'll travel over to used and come back. Um, our capital costs, I've, I've listed, the Mercedes, they were expensive. Um, when I applied for uh, the first one, um, my, my equivalent in US, uh, I had picked a Peugeot Boxer vehicle, which I think had a lifespan of three years or somewhere. So I was a wee bit more ambitious and I went for the dearer one. Um, and then in a way, you're in, you, I'm sure you'll all know when you're applying for funding, it's a bit of a gamble to, uh, when you're laying your stall out, obviously. But I, I felt that in, in the climate we've got, um, in terms of the weight of the buses, the quality of the buses, um, I just went for the Mercedes. Um, but they came in at 56,000, as opposed to the Boxer was about maybe 25. But anyway, we were lucky enough and we got it uh, in, uh, I think it was 2015, uh, 2014, and then in 2015, uh, a similar um, project, uh, a Scottish Government uh, thing, uh, fund came up and I applied for that. Our electric vehicles, very expensive. Um, I was quite shocked. I was looking at maybe getting a 16 seater, uh, um, and some of them are they're quite hard to get as well. But there was the companies that were making them, were, they were looking for maybe 170,000 just for one vehicle. 
And um, in the end, we we opted for to two uh, 78k because we knew it was within our budget. The Nissan EV200 was the smallest vehicle we had, and that came in at 30,000. Uh, 30, um, there was, a, of course, you're, you're going to have to find a charger for them. So at the moment, um, we're waiting for the, uh, we're still waiting after probably near, nearly getting on two years, if not more. Uh, and I know COVID kind of knocked it in the head a wee bit, but um, we're waiting for a three phase charger to get fitted. Um, and the connections cost uh, that, uh, that was laid on top of us, even though we'd asked them, you uh, played a good part in that. Um, we uh, we were finally hit with a bill for fourteen thousand just to connect, and they've not connected it yet. So so they, there's all these costs to take in, into mind. Um, and then the running costs. Well, I didn't even put a figure against that because it is quite phenomenal. Um, you know the um, the fuel costs, the repair costs, parts, insurances. Now at the moment, the the Mercedes uh, they're getting towards ten years old. In fact, they are about ten years old. They're now starting to you're beginning to realise why you got a Mercedes. The parts are so expensive. Um, we've just replaced a, a full exhaust system with um, catalytic converter equivalent type equipment and the bill was £6,500 just for the one vehicle. And as a charity, we need to try and find the money for that. Um, but anyway, it's interesting hearing earlier on from Stuart about the leasing side of it because that's something my board's been talking about for the last wee while. Uh, that we need to get a handle on maybe going down the leasing uh, uh, option. Um, what else have we got? I should have said salary costs as well as a. Um, where did we get our money from? Well, the, the Scottish government, not, when I joined this organisation uh, just about 10 years ago, um, there was a Scottish government minibus grant scheme on the go. Uh, and the emphasis on the, and I can't remember the proper name of it, but the emphasis on it was you had to demonstrate partnership. Um, and Barra, that was fairly easy for Voluntary Action to do that because, as I said, we're an umbrella organisation and all the partners that are uh, in our membership, um, we strive to get each of them onto our board, one, one from all of them on our board because we're an umbrella organisation, we're here to serve them. The partnership thing was easy enough, you know, discussing it with different groups uh, who would maybe have a vision of starting their own um, minibus service. Uh, it was quite interesting. There was no one, nobody within any of those groups wanted anything to do with it because it was just seen to, to be uh, such a challenge to keep vehicles on the road and the cost of it and finding it. So they're quite grateful of having one organisation actually does that for them. We just had demonstrated partnership in the application pretty well and we backed it up and we were fortunate enough to get the grant for that. And then about 18 months later, another uh, transport, it was kind of wider than a minibus, um, and it asked you to demonstrate sustainability. And it's really it's really difficult to, do, uh, to demonstrate sustainability because there's been uh, Scottish government ministers in the past that have stood up in Parliament and said that community transport can't sustain itself. And in a way it can't, because if you think uh, of the displacement we were talking about earlier on there, um, if I was to run one of those small vehicles as a taxi, I would really need to charge taxi fees for it to, uh, if it was to, if I was to put enough money away to replace the vehicle, to pay for the fuel, to, to give me a proper living wage and what have you. It's very difficult. Um, but we, I suppose the turbine in Barra was um, at an early stage at that point, um, 2015, and it was starting, the idea of it was starting to uh, germinate. And I used that a wee bit to say that, you know, the, the, the vision, we couldn't say for definite, but the vision would be that we would see that as a sustainable route, that they would use uh, the wind that's generating power, that's generating income, uh, we would apply for support through that means and any other means, and we would we had the support from the local authority as well. Um, so that so that worked for that. Um, the Coben project that was um, I can't remember what the Coben stands for. It stands for, but that produced as uh, it was an energy pro project. It was linked to the Garavaga too, and, and you would know more uh, about it than I do. But um, we were fortunate enough that a spin-off of that project 
um, uh, provided us with a community of transport vehicle of seven seater. And that was the first electrical vehicle we, we, we got. We had the two Mercedes diesels and we got that small and it's got a range, it's great, it's got a range of 145 miles for an island that's 13 and a half miles round. Um, we can use that uh, all day and every day. And it's a great wee vehicle. And I was saying about car clubs for that small vehicle, there's kind of, I would say there's probably five or six main main villages that are dotted about our island. And if we had one in every village that would be accessible to, say, a village of maybe 60 people or something like that, um, that would that would be an ideal way of uh, encouraging people to get to get around. Um, again, working in partnership with Ewan and Kebab, uh, the community development company, uh, not the food. The Islands Green Recovery Transport Grant came online, and um, we, again we were ambitious with that. Uh, the way we worked in partnership with Ewan's organisation, and we kind of drew up a shopping list. Um, we we knew there was I think there was something like two hundred and fifty thousand pounds available or uh, slightly less, uh, and we knew our own bid was one hundred and ninety five, and then that was taking up most of the fund, and it sounded as if it was well I suppose it was ambitious, but it sounded as if it was greedy as well, but we put it the application form that we put in we put it into small chunks so that we we reckoned if anybody was assessing it they could at least take two or three strands out of that and say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll fund you for these wee bits, but we can't do that. And in a way, that's what worked. And in the end, they actually funded us for mostly everything. I can't remember the bit we left out, but I suppose um, it was the purchase of the the, uh, the bicycles, the electric bicycles. Um, I'll come on to a wee bit more of the green recovery. Uh, and uh, in terms of capital funding, in terms of income, the council, uh, they provide us with a grant of £40,000 a year, which goes a long way to support us in terms of our costs. Um, but we also lay, lay mileage charges on to some of the services that we deliver on behalf of the council and what have you. Um, island, uh, the, uh, the main Island Green Recovery Transport Grant, um, it started off a good few years ago with the community development company developing a, a kind of vision and receiving support to produce a Baran Varsi local energy plan. And that included housing and water and uh, insulation uh, and transport was part of that. It was included in part of that. And, and so having developed, Bara having developed that local energy plan as a study and a piece of work, we use that then as a, a main reference for future funding applications. And that's what helped us uh, get a foot in the door with the Islands Green Recovery Transport Grant, uh, because we found uh, we were fortunate enough to be pretty much well ahead of the game uh, in, 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 in other areas uh, nearby. Um, and the main focus on that was decarbonising inclusive uh, inclusive community transport. That's what we said to the Island Green Recovery we were going to do. We're going to integrate the transport with active travel and supporting locals to make active journeys. Uh, I was really pleased to hear Stuart's presentation because I think there's loads in there that I can pick his brains with and uh, look at that because we're still on that active uh, travel journey very much so. Uh, we're actually falling behind a wee bit because of COVID, because of the lack of connectivity. But the plans that we have in place for our two main uh, electric minibuses are still uh, in place to try and continue to develop active travel on our small island. And that, that can be for our locals and it can also be for our visitors. So um, we're going to be putting more focus on that over the next couple of years. And the idea there was to uh, initiate Castleby as a mobility hub. Uh, and the idea was you would get people on and off buses and uh, electric buses and they could jump on a bicycle and then whatever, coming off a maybe a yacht at the marina, they can pick up a bicycle and cycle around. So it's, it's still very much a learning process uh, for everyone, everyone on that. Um, so thinking about the funding applications, if I was to give people advice and uh, our main ingredients for the funding applications is the demonstration of partnership from community groups, because uh, that's important. And 
you, you, you don't particularly want to get into competition and the displacement is an important thing. Um, we have two bus companies on the island and we work very closely with them and we try not to, well, we don't stand on their toes. Um, they work to a public bus service that's pretty poor. Uh, it's not their fault. Um, it's the, it's the access, access of funding that they have. So they have to work with the, uh, the money they get from the local authority to deliver a bus service. For instance, in Barra, uh, our ferries in the summer don't come in at eight o'clock at night, but the, the last bus uh, from Castleby is around about four o'clock. So uh, my wife, who works in a shop, finishes at half five. Um, if I wasn't around, she'd have to get a taxi home because she doesn't drive. So um, it, it, it's really quite a poor bus service, and that gives us an opportunity to develop our own services or community transport and maybe look at using that as an opportunity to, to, to raise more money, uh, as long as the main operators didn't object. And uh, Stuart mentioned these permits, uh, they're, they're the exact same. We're the same. We've got a Section 19 and Section 20 permits that let us do certain things. And although we're a not-for-profit charity company, we are allowed to, to levy charges um, but we have to work very closely with uh, the buses, uh, the bus operators on the island. Um, so, so the partnership working is important. The demonst uh, demonstrating the evidence of need, I'd say that's crucial. Uh, and I mean, most areas will be able to do that. You all know your own areas and you know what works and what doesn't uh, and what's lacking and what isn't. Um, Drawing on each other's strengths, and uh, again, it's that working in partnership with community groups who are well versed in uh, certain areas. Some people may be more uh, versed in financial matters, and other ones are more uh, in the environment. And that's what we found in Barra is the best way forward. Uh, and then trying to get us to think more social enterprise. Um, who people tend to think social enterprises aren't real businesses, but they really are, and and we have to learn to be more. We need to think about our income more. Um, we quite often give our buses out to groups uh, and we don't necessarily charge them the commercial rate that we should be charging them because we're very conscious, uh, conscious we're a charity and we're here to support uh, local groups. Um, and then think, so just try to encourage people to think commercially. Um, we did have uh, someone on the island recently who, and uh, sorry, uh, you and you refer to him, uh, to them who has started a type of car club in a sense yeah, with their small vehicle he he asked if he could hire our vehicle and we were saying well we're a membership organization and we we, we have various services we support our members with so if you're starting a car club of some sort there's more kind of a travel club i think he was traveling he was talking about you take out a membership of voluntary action, you become one of our members and then you'll benefit from some of our services, which would be that we would lend you the small electric vehicle if you want to use it and if it's available and if we can level it, level a charge. So he's 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 done that for three weeks now, which has been quite interesting on a Sunday because uh, people are saying, why is he driving that? Uh, why is he driving your bus and things like that? But that's small island mentality. So that's that's where we are in Barra. That's sorry. That's a very quick run through of what uh, uh, what we've been doing. The one thing I forgot to do was put pictures, nice pictures, in of my vehicles and my fleet. Um, but uh, I'll do that maybe the next time. The, just thinking in terms of we got the demand for the insurance annual insurance, um, and it does place a lot of uh, pressure on organisations. Uh, so that's why I think maybe the franchise thing's a, a good idea. Uh, we got our insurance request uh, renewal the other day for the five vehicles, and the quote was for ten and a half thousand pounds. So that's that's a huge amount of money for a charity to try and uh, recoup that. Uh, and like I say, with the Mercedes vehicles, the older um, Mercedes, we're, we're trying to uh, look at. Um, oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Kath. We're trying to look at options uh, for that. Um, to see if uh, there's a, a better way of doing it. That gives you an idea of the vehicles. We've got the small uh, uh, Nissan in the bottom right, and then the two electric white ones and the two diesels in the minute. But we're, we're very lucky. The, the cost of keeping them up and running is expensive, but they provide a great service. And without that, it'd be very difficult uh, for 
uh, the elderly and the, the youth to get around the island and a lot more costly for their families to do that. So uh, thanks, Kath. I'm happy to take any questions if that's... Yes, anybody want to ask even anything about, or Stuart, about their newly acquired bus? Um, there may be challenges there that people can re resonate with, um, but certainly the information that Ewan has given us for a well-established service. Um, anybody got any, <clears throat> any comments or questions about that? I've got one. Uh, uh, so your your buses, your, sorry, your drivers are all paid drivers, right? Yep. Do you are you able to cover all their wages and and costs with income from the bus service, or do you get external funding for that on a yearly basis to help with the operation of the? Yeah, um, I think uh, if we didn't have the, the council grant, which used to be £52,000 a year um, when I started 10 years ago, but uh, as usual with council um, budgets, they get cut year on year. Um, the, uh, we get £40,000 a year from them. Uh, the council at the moment are going through a period of um, uh, uh, looking at a transport strategy for the Western Isles and uh, community transport is part of that, and I've been feeding into that uh, because the importance uh, of community transport in the Southern Isles is not particularly understood by our um, council in the Northern Isles, uh, which isn't just a complaint. I mean, what we were finding when we looked into it, we were finding that the community transport buses in the North were getting used for running football teams so the council were paying for maybe a minibus for a football team who would use it to go to the mainland. And I'm not taking away from that. It was also, uh, they were also being used for taking um, uh, people from further away into the centre of Stornoway uh, at night to go to the pubs and to go to the cinema, which again, it's all, it's all relevant. However, our, our community transport was getting used directly to carry probably the most vulnerable types of people, almost the mo most vulnerable types of people. Um, and so our argument was to try and, um, rather than cutting a, a, a bus from the west side of Lewis that takes people into the pub and the cinema, um, try and put a, uh, use a lot more of that money to, to sustain more services that are, in my mind, more realistic uh, in, in terms of the needs of the, the community that we have. But uh, we couldn't do it with the, the income we have. We we uh, we have to uh, we probably rely a, a, a quite a bit as well on other income that we generate through some some of the areas that I pointed earlier on. The our local newspaper, for instance, uh, brings us in an income, and we use that uh, as that's kind of free money in the sense that it's not ring fenced for any particular service. So we can use that to uh, help sustain. Um, but I think if uh, if the council grant gets cut another 10 or 20 percent over the next year, we would really have to look at reducing our services or relying more maybe on volunteers to drive uh, the vehicles. Thanks for that. OK. Anyone else um, got anything to contribute or <clears throat> or to ask? I've got more, but I didn't want to hog, so I'll let you go again. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, go ahead, Stuart. Well, you, you were mentioned, because we take a, a lot of um, vulnerable people just now, and one of the issues, and we've had um, an issue right at the start when we took on the bus, of collecting people from a, a nursing home, and they weren't probably in a fit state to be on the bus without an escort, like you mentioned, and the driver felt a lot of pressure because he had to deal with certain situations. Um, and you said they're paid as well. Yeah. Is that on, is that, are they on, is that like an ad hoc, like zero hours thing, or do you actually have them on, like? No, um, I think it's something that we're actually looking at to see how, how we can actually get around the zero hour contracts. 
because we're not greatly in favour of them, especially being a charity. Um, however, the 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 real the realistic part of it is we can't guarantee uh, the services every day, all day, especially because of the weather we get up here. Um, but we try and give them at least five to six hours every day, Monday to Friday. And it's, it is on a zero hours contract, but we're really seriously looking to swap that over onto a, a, a proper hours, fixed hours contract. But there'll be, it, it's kind of difficult for us to do it this now and we need to make sure that we've got the, the income to do that. Um, as it is, the buses run all the time. The only thing that puts the weather off, sorry, the buses off is the weather. And it's usually the wind, it's not. We might have a bit of a weather issue there with Ewan's connection, possibly. I think he was going to say it's the wind, not the rain, <laughs> that causes potential problems. Ewan, Scott, I don't know if you're in the same office as... No, unfortunately, I'm coming in. I think we're both coming in from home. The only other thing is, I can say, is high tides yesterday. We had the roads flooded with high tides. At four Sorry, you and can I just point out we're we're losing your volume. I'm not sure what's happening. The only other thing is high tides, um, which we had the road cut points around the island yesterday, mm -hmm. um, which is why we're interested in the carbon neutral island project. Yes, yeah, which is one of yeah, which is one of the projects that you're partnering up with Community Energy Scotland, along with five other islands. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously, I really hope that the information that's been shared today will help contribute to some of the development plans that come out of, of um, some of the auditing that's taking place as part of that project. Um, and not only that, but our existing members may benefit from the information today. And any anybody who isn't a member of CS membership is free. Um, and you know, if, if you do want to um, make sure that you get updates from us and, and are able to share information, then please do become a member. I think we're, uh, it doesn't seem that anybody else has any more questions. Ewan's not here at the moment. He may be able to get back in, um, but luckily he was able to um, stay connected for the most critical part of his um, part in, in today's event. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, both Ewan in his absence and Stuart very much for your time today. It's very much appreciated. Um, very valuable information and experiences that you've both been able to share. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and for your time today. And I hope it's been a very useful event for you. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to end here. Um, as I said, my uh, email is in the chat. So please do copy that before we leave. And you can contact me for any other information that you need, including sets of slides. Although the recording will be available on YouTube shortly, as I mentioned before. I would like to mention something. Now, I'm, I do, I must apologize to Stu, both Stuart and Ewan about this because I haven't forewarned them that I was going to mention this. Um, but the Community Learning Exchange, um, which is a fund managed by the Scottish Communities Alliance, which some people may already be aware of, um, they um, can provide uh, funding for travel and accommodation for visiting communities who identify a host community that they think they can learn from. Um, the host community also has an allowance for their time um, and partners of Scottish Communities Alliance, um, we are one of their partners, are able to um, sign through their, their own members for um, an application. So um, if anybody did want to apply or I could identify a, a community group that they would like to visit and would like to apply for that funding, then please do get in touch with us. As I said, um, you can use my, my email address. Um, I'm just going to put the link here for Community Learning Exchange in case anybody finds that useful before we sign off. Um, 
I think that um, that's it. that's pretty much us. So thank you so much again for coming. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you all for your time. I hope you found it valuable. Please get in touch if you've got anything else that you'd like to ask. And have a great day, everybody. And see you all soon enough, I hope. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.